Thank you, Vahid. I don't know where you've gone for the previous talk. It was um, um, really interesting stuff, and I think it was the, the perfect precursor. So I think um, I'm just going to continue where you left it. And um, as you said, human intelligence is very good at asking questions, um, which is mostly what I'll be doing. I don't have many answers. It's mostly questions. So I think that's a good sign. Um, right, OK, so when I look around uh, and um, I take a look at the things that I find to be most interesting in, in life, uh, I see a lot of painting. I see sculpture. I see music. I see architecture. Even in terms of uh, society, like the way we organize ourselves and we do politics, um, there's a lot of interesting creativity happening all around us. And when I think deeply about it, I realize that all of this is due to um, a particular organ that we possess, our brains, and uh, characteristics that this uh, organ has. And Artificial intelligence, uh, in my view, is the study of the characteristics of this organ and an attempt to um, recreate it. So what is it that this brain is doing that generates all of this intricate um, beauty around us? Um, and how can we recreate that ourselves? And in particular, I'm going to try and answer um, a question that was raised in the previous talk, which is whether um, it is possible to be creative even if you don't have a biological brain. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about all the different ways AI can be used to do things in the world. I'm going to go right for the question, can you be creative um, with a non-biological brain? And to begin, um, I want to give a very brief um, history of AI, uh, not because uh, it'll contain things that you wouldn't have heard before, but more because it will create a shared vocabulary that we can use to to discuss the things that we want to talk about. So we begin with computers. Um, computers are actually devices that we've had for hundreds of years. Um, and here's an example of one that's, I think, about 800 years old. It's called an astrolabe. It's a mechanical device that astronomers would have used to calculate the positions of the stars and the positions of Earth in relation to them. And the way it works is basically this device um, and the astronomer that uses it um, implement an algorithm uh, that, when followed, gives you the answer that you want, where you are and where are the stars. And what happened in the previous century, which created a huge amount of uh, interest and progress, um, wasn't the invention of the computer itself, but the invention of the programmable computer. So the programmable computer is a device that uh, takes some inputs and an algorithm and gives you outputs that you care about. And what's special about a programmable computer is that you can change the algorithm in order to get different kinds of inputs, uh, different kinds of outputs. So the same machine that does summation can render images, can do image search, can do text search, can generate um, documents and all sorts of other things that we care about. And programmable computing obviously has created to huge advances in, um, in our society. But very quickly, people realize that there are certain tasks that we really care about, um, that we can execute ourselves, that we can't get computers to execute for us. And the reason for that is that we don't know the algorithm that we would have to give to the computer to get the output that we care about. So an example of that is image classification. If I give um, as input to the computer, an image of a horse. And if I want the computer to say, this image contains a horse, um, we basically didn't know how to do it. I mean, this field is called computer vision. And um, it's been around uh, since the early uh, 50s and 60s. And we just couldn't find a way of specifying that algorithm, even though we were very capable of doing it ourselves. And this is where machine learning comes into play. Um, so in the past um, couple of years, we've been able to create techniques that effectively find the algorithm for us. That's one, one view of machine learning. And the way it works is we create these big data sets of input and output pairs. And uh, we feed this to the computer that gives us the algorithm uh, by itself. So this data set, for instance, says this image is an image of a horse, this image is an image of a cat, this image is an image of a dog, repeated millions of times. 
And the computer turns through the data and says, OK, this is a neural network, which is another way of saying this is an algorithm that can map these inputs to these outputs. And if you do this well, um, you end up with really magical applications. Um, so here's an example of a system that's looking at um, pictures of animals and labeling things mostly correctly. Sometimes it makes mistakes. Um, you can see birds. And I think the next one is pretty cool. Surfboard sometimes. <laughs> so it's not perfect. Um, but if you do this well, you end up with um, techniques that you know, can uh, detect the positions of your face, can detect cars and pedestrians, and is used for self-driving cars. And uh, the same techniques are used in the stock market. It's really ubiquitous. It's absolutely everywhere these days. Um, but there's a very clear question as soon as you start working with, this, with these techniques, which is, where does the data come from? Where do we get these labeled data sets? And what do we do if we don't have that data um, in advance of us trying to tackle the problem? And a potential solution to this is the framework of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning says that we're going to allow the computer to gather its own data uh, in, a, in response to rewards uh, that it gets from the environment. The way it's set up is that you have this agent, um, which is the computer, and it's interacting with an environment. And the agent sends actions to the environment. It says, I want to move my arm, or I want to press this button, and so on. The environment changes in response to that action and sends back to the agent certain observations. So for instance, it says, now that the state of the environment has changed, uh, this is what it looks like. And one of the observations that the environment sends back is a reward. It says, you are now in a better state than you were before, or you're now in a worse state than you were before. And a particular example of this that got people really excited about four years ago was some work that my colleagues did where they um, created these deep neural network agents that interacted with um, the Atari uh, gaming environment. So what's happening here is the agent is um, effectively controlling a joystick, uh, sending actions like move up, down, left, and right. These actions are being sent to the Atari game environment. And um, what is sent back is the state of the game, which is the pixels on the screen. And as rewards, the agent gets the score. So you have 51 points, you have 55 points, and so on. And the agent is trying to maximize its score. And what's happening here is reinforcement learning um, in terms of its definition. Now, if you do this well, uh, you end up with results that look like this. So with a little bit of training, the computer knows how to control the paddle mostly so that it's not losing many points. I mean, it's not perfect. It's still missing, just like it was classifying the, the, the penguin as a surfboard. But it's doing a good job. Now, as you train it more and more, you see that the agent actually gets better at controlling the paddle, because it realizes that this is how um, it can get more points. And um, with more training, it gets really good at controlling the paddle. It's not missing the ball anymore. But what's kind of cool is that if you train it for long enough, it ends up learning a strategy that is actually um, fairly surprising. So it creates a tunnel on the left, and then it sends the ball behind uh, the bricks. Um, now, this strategy is interesting for two reasons. One is that it requires really precise control to execute. Um, but also, it's a strategy that um, many humans wouldn't even think of. So in a sense, it's, um, you might call it a little bit creative. But perhaps a more interesting example or more forceful example of that is work that, again, my colleagues did a year after that in the context of the game Go. So raise of hands, who here knows what Go is? OK, most people know. Um, but I'll give a brief uh, explanation. So Go is this um, ancient uh, Eastern Asian board game. Think of it as being a bit similar to chess, where you have these stones, these black and white stones, that are being placed by two players onto the Go board. And the objective of the game is to uh, control as much space on the board as possible. And there are certain rules around where you can place stones and which parts of the board are considered to be yours. 
And culturally, it's hugely significant. So in, uh, in countries like Japan and China and Korea, it's uh, a game that is often taught to kids as they're growing up. And in fact, you can go to go schools that are um, uh, specifically designed to train kids to become good Go players. Um, and for thousands of years, it's actually been ingrained in the culture to the extent that it's been considered to be one of the four or five things that a scholar is supposed to learn. You know, you're supposed to learn about warfare and literature and music and Go. And you know, Confucius talked about it. And part of the reason why it has this stature is because as you play the game of Go, you realize that at every given point in time, you have to make a decision. And that decision is, where do I place my stone? That is a hugely complex decision. And the reason for that is that the number of places you can place the stone and the number of ways in which your opponent can react to it is incredibly large. And what this means is that good Go players, when they play the game, um, to them, it doesn't feel like they are calculating as much as it feels like they are making an intuitive uh, decision. Um, they place a stone and they say that this is a beautiful move, or this is an artistic move, or it's a creative move. And so for this reason, for a long time, people thought that computers would never be able to compete. Um, computers are um, good mathematicians, but they're not creative in that sense. So we, um, we worked on this system, which was a combination of machine learning and reinforcement learning, um, wherein after the process of training, you end up with two neural networks. And I just need to explain these two um, because they'll become handy later. So one neural network is called the policy network. And it takes as input the uh, state of the board game. Uh, so this is where are the white stones and where are the black stones. It processes them with a neural network, and it produces a policy. So the policy is like it's saying, this is where I um, have a preference for the placing of the stone. I prefer it. I would prefer it if the stone was placed in this particular location. So this is one object. Uh, that is the output of learning. The other object is the value network. The value network takes the board as input again. It processes it, and it produces one number as output. And that number. Uh, is saying, how good is the state that I'm currently in? Uh, am I losing or am I winning? And then if you combine these two together in just the right way, you can do very effective search, which means that given a board state, um, you can compute what a good move would be. So right, and then once you've done this, um, you and the, the way you train it is you take uh, one of these systems and you play it against itself effectively. So the system plays against itself millions or billions of times until it finds strategies that are likely um, to lead to, to wins. So we had a system that was working quite well. This is back in 2015, I think. And um, to the extent that um, we thought that this might be um, a professional level Go player. Uh, and what we did was we organized this show match between AlphaGo, which was this computer system, and Lee Sedol, who was, at that point in time, uh, the highest ranking Go player in the world. And there was a ton of um, media interest in this um, due to you know, the cultural significance of this game. Uh, something like 60 million people watched the game live, um, which is a huge number if you think about it. This is almost like Super Bowl territory interest uh, in a board game. And the games last about five hours, if I remember correctly. So there's, uh, there's five games that are played. And this is what the game actually looks like in real life. So you have uh, Lisa Roll on the right. And AlphaGo is being operated by my colleague Aja. So the, this is the computer saying, this is where I want to place the next stone. And Aja actually places the next stone. Um, and I remember watching this game from London at 4 AM. It was super exciting. We're in the office. and. Um, you know, watching the, the two play against each other. And it takes a couple of hours. And there was a particular moment that was really memorable to me. Um, and it was in game two. And the image that I'm showing here is an image of two commentators as the game was progressing. So these commentators, especially the guy on the right, he's the, uh, he was, at that point in time, I think, the number one ranking European player at the game of Go, um, which made him something like number 200 in the world. <laughs> um, 
there's no ghost schools here, you know. That's, um, and he was commenting on the game as it was happening. And there was a moment in, uh, in the second game, which has now become completely uh, famous, which was move 37. So the computer placed the stone in a location that was um, traditionally taught to be a very bad move. So basically, like almost in the first stages of learning how to play Go, you're taught to never place that stone in that position because it's thought to be a terrible, terrible idea. And the computer placed the stone in that position, and Aja was checking to make sure that he was actually reading the stone uh, correctly, and everyone else was saying, like, this is such a dumb move. And um, Lisa Roll actually spent a lot of time thinking about his next move after that uh, stone, because he was surprised as well. Like, why is it doing this? And I remember the commentator saying that this is, uh, that AlphaGo is almost certainly going to lose this game, because this is just a really bad move. But as the game progressed, um, people realized that that move actually led the game into a part of space that is never explored by human players. And AlphaGo ended up winning that game. And in retrospect, people now study that move and consider it to be a hugely influential moment in Go history because it um, showed us that it's possible to play the game in a way that we hadn't been playing before. And again, some people consider this to be um, a creative insight uh, produced by this game. Now, in the end, uh, AlphaGo won four games to one, um, which is amazing for AlphaGo, but it's also amazing for Lisa at all. Like, it's super impressive to see a human uh, actually compete with you know, a server, server farm of computers. Um, but yeah, to me, this was also a really interesting moment. You know, can we consider this moment to be a creative moment or not? Now, if I step back uh, a little bit and uh, try to connect the things that I've been showing to uh, urban design and architecture and art, and if I had to summarize everything that's happened in AI, I would say that um, AI has really led us to two kinds of tools. And um, one of them I would call optimization, and the other I would call generation. And I think what has mostly been publicized until now is the former. And um, what really hasn't been explored as much is the latter. So optimization uh, is about finding the best solution to a problem via trial and error. And in architecture, you know, genetic algorithms have been used for this for a long time. So here's an example of column positions being um, experimented with by the computer. Uh, and there's an objective function that you can see on the left. And the lower the computer gets that curve, the better. So for instance, the computer might be trying to place the columns in a way that reduces their count whilst maximizing the stability of the building and improving airflow, something like that. And there's lots of examples of this working in practice, and people have actually built buildings that have resulted from these processes. And we saw many of these examples in the previous talk as well. Um, another example is um, this building, I think it's in Berlin, where each one of the panels was optimized by a computer system to, um, to, to, yeah, to optimize the acoustic properties of the, of the whole building. And this is something that simply wouldn't have been possible by hand, given the number of panels and the number of decisions that need to be made for each one of the panels. Um, and there's a ton of examples of that work. But what I want to focus more, more on is the generation aspect. So generation is, about, is not about finding the best solution to a problem, but more about capturing the range of good solutions to a problem. Um, and this means that it needs to be a little bit more flexible, and it needs to uh, understand the relative goodness of things, which is often a, quite a difficult thing to do. So one good example, I think, of this idea is something that actually isn't uh, machine learning, and it's not learned. Um, and it's the way the MIT Media Lab designed this logo uh, a couple of years ago. So they had this computer program that would arrange um, colorful blocks next to each other in a particular way that was uniquely identifiable, immediately identifiable as MIT Media Lab, but was infinitely variable. So you could sample these three colors in as many different positions as you want. 
um, that gave you lots of different logos that you could use for your different departments or on different business cards. Each poster had its own little logo. Uh, different people had their unique logos. And what I find really beautiful about this is that you can immediately tell that it's MIT Media Lab, but you get infinite variety. Now, as I said, there's nothing learned about this. The algorithm, the genius behind it, the creativity behind it is completely uh, human. Some human has designed this and written it up as code. But it's also possible to learn uh, some of that, just like we did with computer vision, for instance. I'm going to call this mimetic generation. I, this is a name that I came up with by myself. I'm sure you've seen this before. This is style transfer. And I think it's an example of how you can learn that kind of um, distribution generation. So here we have uh, an input image and uh, an artwork that a human has drawn prior, pre previously. And what the algorithm is doing is it's transferring the style of this artwork to this image to create this larger image B on the right. And if you change the artwork but keep the image fixed, you can get some really striking results. And this is transferring Van Gogh's painting style over. And this is, um, I forget his name. Yeah, that's the one. Um, and so on. And um, this is an example of uh, a, a particular kind of transfer that, again, is infinite, but is transferring what was thought to be uniquely Van Gogh or was thought to be uniquely Picasso and so on. Now, there's another kind also. Um, which I'll call realistic generation. And this is where you, um, you want to learn, you want to give the computer a data set, and you want it to learn exactly what you mean in its entirety. And a good example of this is work that I actually did uh, during my PhD thesis. So this is seven years ago now. And um, very related to the, the, the cities that we saw in the previous talk. So what's happening here is that I've trained uh, effectively a neural network on a data set of pictures of horses. And the blue section is a section that I'm cutting out of the horse. And I'm asking the, com the neural network to create samples for what it thinks could be um, a completion of that image. So the different samples are saying, well, it could be this horse or it could be that horse. And as I increase the number of pixels that are missing, the variability increases. And I can put constraints. So I'm putting some black pixels down, and it brings the horses back down in response to that. Or I think what I'll do next is I'll put some white pixels. And you see that it raises its leg. And what's cool about this is that if you think about it, it's very difficult to explain to a computer what a horse looks like by writing code, right? Um, and if I can instead learn that, then I have a system that I can easily transfer to another domain. So here, for instance, I've taken the same code and I've trained it on pictures of motorbikes. And I can do the same kinds of things that I was doing before. I can produce samples. Um, I can change its constraints. Um, and I can play with it. It becomes a, a kind of tool that I can use to generate new objects. And what's really remarkable is that this is back in 2012. And in the intervening six or seven years, those techniques are now producing images like this. So this is a neural network trained on images of faces. These two people don't exist. Um, these are images that a similar system has produced from scratch. And um, it really is getting to the fidelity where it's very difficult to tell if it's real or fake, going, going to your question. And um, I, don't, I haven't seen. Um, tools that allow you to interactively play with these faces yet. But in principle, there's nothing that would say that that isn't possible. But what I want to talk about um, for the rest of the talk is what I call constrained generation. So in the previous example, the neural network has direct access to each one of the pixels. It can manipulate these pixels one by one to create an image that looks realistic. But when I paint um, a portrait, I don't really do that. I, um, I use a brush, or I use um, some clay, or um, I go into Photoshop, or I render with Maya, or something like that. And so we wondered whether we can get um, computers to create images in a similar 
way to ourselves uh, in the hope that we would then be able to interact with them more easily. And to do that, we took a reinforcement learning agent and we put it in a simulated painting environment. Uh, so think something like Photoshop. And we have an agent, and the agent uh, takes actions in that environment. And whereas previously, the agents uh, would have been uh, pressing buttons on a joystick or placing stones on a go board, the agent now places strokes on a simulated canvas. So for instance, it says, I want to start off in this location. I want to put a control point there. I want to put the end point there. And I'm going to draw a green line with this thickness. That's one action. Okay. And then we have a framework that looks like this, um, where you start off in the bottom right with an agent. And the agent is sending actions to the environment, much like before. And the environment is a canvas that is putting these strokes down. And um, this is almost exactly the same as the previous reinforcement learning setup, except we also need to be able to provide a reward to the agent, so how well it's doing, basically. And to do that, we actually train a second neural network. So what happens is that the state of the canvas is sent as an image to a neural network that we call the discriminator. And the discriminator is trying to assess whether the canvas looks real or fake. And then how confused the discriminator is, is sent as a reward to the agent. So the agent is sending actions. This is going to the discriminator. Its confusion is coming back to the agent. And what the agent is trying to do is trying to make the discriminator as confused as possible. This is repeated billions of times again until you end up with an agent that is um, drawing. And as was mentioned before, this is called the Generative Adversarial Network Family of Models, or as a GAN. Now, I, I want to link this back up to AlphaGo. Um, and I'm going to do that by showing you what you get at the end of training. So in effect, the two things you're training are a policy network and a discriminator network. So the policy network takes uh, incomplete canvas as input. It processes it with a neural network, and it sends an action out as output. And the second is a discriminator network that takes the final canvas as input, and it sends out um, a decision as to whether this is real or fake. Um, another way of naming these two, potentially, could have been that this is the artist, and this is the critic. Um, but we didn't go for that. But you can see the kind of connection there. Anyway, if you train this well enough uh, on, say, um, handwritten digits, you end up with results that look like this. So on the right, I have um, digits that have actually been drawn by humans, pictures of digits that have been drawn by humans. And on the left, you have the computer agent um, trying to reproduce that image. And you can see that it's producing a sequence of actions that ends with an image that resembles the target. And what's important to m mention here is that the computer has never seen a human in the process of drawing a digit. It's only ever seen the final result. It's, in effect, discovered that process by itself through trial and error. And you can take the same agent and train it on uh, slightly more complex data. So these are characters, um, uh, again, handwritten by humans um, of various um, alphabet types. And on the left, you have the computer reproducing those characters. Now, when I saw this, uh, I was excited because it was producing good reconstructions. But there was one character in particular that really caught my eye, and it's this one here. And for those of you who um, uh, speak languages or write in languages that have three dots, for instance, Arabic, you'll know that the way the computer summarizes or um, shortcuts those three dots is exactly like how humans do it. So um, Arabic speakers, when they want to do three dots very quickly, they do ex the same uh, kind of little uh, semicircle. And so I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. Um, and I'll get back to this in a second. Now, I want to emphasize um, one of the benefits of this kind of learning. So I've gone through all this trouble to get the computer to draw with a brush. Why did I do that? 
One of the reasons for this is the, the interpretation that the computer now has is physically realizable. Um, I can take uh, an image, I can give it to the computer, and it says, this is how I would draw the image with a pen or a brush. And I can actually execute that on a robot. Uh, this is very different to how an autoencoder interprets an image, um, which is as a bunch of numbers. You know, it's, not, um, it's not connected to the real world in the same way. So what we did next was uh, we took the same system, we scaled it up a bit, and um, started training on a data set of human faces. And um, if you train this well enough and for long enough, um, you actually end up with a system that can produce images of this kind. So these are um, intermediate steps of the agent trying to produce an image that looks real to it. Um, it has about 1,000 interactions with the canvas to create that final image in the bottom right. And what I'm showing is intermediate steps. I think it's like once every 70 steps or so. So what's cool is that it's um, actually producing an image that is beginning to look kind of like a portrait. And again, I want to emphasize that the computer's never seen a human draw a portrait. It's only ever seen real photos of real faces. Uh, so the long-term uh, planning that it does and the way it moves the brush and the way it mixes colors and all of that is learned through trial and error. Uh, this is another example of a face. And you can see how uh, the reinforcement learning paradigm teaches it to get some balance of getting the face early on with uh, getting the face at the end. Uh, this is the discount factor for those in the know you can set the discount factor to different values, and it says, OK, how much do you want to be greedy uh, in, in, in order to get the face as fast as possible? And how much are you willing to wait and get your rewards at the end? And this is a video of uh, the agent actually drawing. So I'll just let you watch it. So it's surprisingly dexterous, actually. You can see how many little strokes it has to place to get the, the highlights and the shading. And then I think it was Bob Ross that says there, there are never any mistakes. There are only happy accidents. And the, the computer also has the same thing. Like it's, um, it's never completely sure where it wants to put the, the, the brush. And it does make mistakes. And sometimes um, it fixes those mistakes. It puts a brush and says, oh, that really didn't work. So now I have to cover it up. So this was really exciting to us, but clearly it's not, um, it's not as realistic as the stuff that I showed you before. You know, we have other techniques that produce faces that look much more realistic. Um, but what's more interesting to me is what happens instead if I actually restrict the agent. So if instead of 1,000 steps with a canvas, the agent only has 10 or 20 interactions with a canvas, what kinds of images would it produce then? And um, this is the kind of thing that it does. So this is an agent that is given, I don't know, 21 steps to interact with the canvas. And it knows it only has 21 steps to interact with the canvas. And it's trying its best to produce a picture of a face that looks real. And this is what it chooses to do. I find it really interesting. So it could have drawn something that was really blurry. It could have drawn uh, something that was well, it couldn't have drawn something that was realistic because it didn't have enough time. What it chose to do was to draw something that actually is quite um, abstract, I would say. So you've got two eyes, you've got a nose, the lips, and the contours of the face. And what you're seeing here are every step. So I'm not subsampling anymore. This is literally every step that is required to generate this image. And if you pay attention to this one up here, this third action, I think is quite interesting. So it draws this red line. And you might wonder, okay, wh why is it drawing a red line? But if you trace it down, you'll see that that red line is the, the blush in her cheeks, um, which, uh, which is really cool. And this is completely not programmed in, right? And it's not even learned from humans. Again, it hasn't seen how humans draw. It's only ever seen real photos of faces. So it's effectively something that is discovered itself, I would say. 
And if you sample enough times from enough agents, these are the kinds of images that you get um, when you have restricted uh, episodes. So let's start off with this one. I really like this one. So literally a dot for each eye, two lines for the nose, one line for the mouth. And if you were to ask me you know, two years ago what would have been necessary to produce something like this, I would have for sure said that culture is necessary for this. You know, Kids draw in that way because their parents teach them to draw in that way or because they're exposed to drawing books that draw in that way. Uh, but it turns out that um, if you have a big neural network and a brush and enough time, you can actually discover this as a good strategy for drawing faces. Other ones that I like, I like this one in the top left. It kind of looks like a Picasso. Um, this one, also Picasso-like, I love it. Um, this one is very abstract. It's uh, given up on the nose. It's just gone for the eyes and the mouth. Um, this one as well. This has done the whole thing with like one complex stroke. And I would argue that some of these would actually be kind of um, you know, I'd be happy to have one on my wall, um, but that's just me. Okay, so if I go back to how I set up computing in the beginning, is it really the case that art is just taking some paint as input with some weird algorithm um, and then producing an output that kind of excites people? Um, and this is a topic that has already come up in the Q&A after the first talk. And I don't think this really isn't the case. I think this is way too simplistic. What the human is doing there isn't just taking paint and producing a painting. There's lots of complex interaction with other agents. There's an intention to communicate a message often. Um, and there's a really intricate feedback loop that goes on where the artist produces a painting, gets feedback on that, whether it's praise or whether it's money or something else, and then that affects the drawing. And clearly, what I've shown so far isn't doing any of that. But I think it is interesting to draw a parallel to what happened to painting when photography was um, invented. So I don't know if this is historically accurate, but it's my interpretation that for hundreds of years, humans um, thought that a sign of artistic mastery is your ability to produce photorealistic images. And we would have uh, worked very hard to produce an image like this. And when um, photography uh, came about, people realized that actually you can just press a button and produce a photorealistic image. And I think that was one of the reasons why we actually moved to producing images that were more like this. Uh, because this was something that a photo couldn't produce. And, um, and it forced us towards um, conceptual paintings, towards abstract paintings, and towards the expression of ideas more than images. And I think the same thing is likely to happen with the kinds of tools that I showed as well. So for instance, with style transfer, we now know that drawing in the style of Van Gogh isn't something special. It's something that you know, your mobile phone can do in half a second. Or drawing in the style of Picasso perhaps isn't so special anymore either. And um, with the other results, like with the portrait painting, maybe we'll soon realize that you know, abstract paintings of faces aren't so special either anymore. And what that raises is a question. And that question, I think, will have many answers. And the question is, um, what are we trying to do when we're creating art? And what is uniquely human about that process that can't be done with anything else? Um, so I'm going to leave it there and hopefully open it up for discussions where we can talk about it more. Cool. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <Yes. laughs> this is the first time. <laughs> well, um, wow. Um, it's difficult for me because um, I'm more or less, um, I started out as a designer. I more or less um, um, evolved over years into um, engineering and so on and so on. So for me, um, I don't know where to start, actually. <laughs> um, I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, 
Um, so I absolutely agree with you that um, there is a technical aspect to even art that you can emulate, that you can teach to a machine um, to, to produce on its own. Um, but that is exactly what it is. It is in technical expression. Unless you can show me that um, any of your machines has walked through a severe depression, <laughs> has, um, I don't know, served in the First World War, has um, fallen in love and actually experienced um, the entire setup of um, um, that um, emotion from um, the beginning to um, the absolute heartbreak and the tears at the end, um, there is something missing. And that is the experience um, that these people ex um, 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 put forward um, and actually express through their art. So, again, I absolutely agree with you on the technical aspect of design. And that's why I was also a little bit um, um, concerned when you showed us the MIT logo. Because um, I'm happy that you, in the end, mentioned that it was actually a human mm -hmm. which has actually put it forward. And it was a machine that helped him to express it. Um, because otherwise I would have said, um, again, um, uh, that's not really the purpose of a design to be just a technical expression. Um, it is supposed to, um, 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 uh, especially when it comes to a logo, to, to a branding, to express um, um, the personality, the character of the object that you're standing for. Um, so um, for me, the question is, um, um, how do you see it now that I actually f thrown that at you? Um, um, would you say, yes, there is a natural um, 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 uh, border um, um, to, to what a human accumulates in his um, um, entire um, lifetime and expresses through art? Or do you say, no, even that a machine could adopt or um, adapt to at one point and actually um, um, produce it um, on its own? Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I don't think. Um uh, clearly, none of these agents have been depressed. As, well, I don't think they have, anyway. Um, and I do think that it's uh, it's important for art that the artist has experienced things and that the viewer has experienced things. There's this really amazing paper uh, called "Can Computers Create Art?" Uh, it's written by Aaron Hertzman uh, from Adobe, and he lists uh, several criteria he considers um, exist for the creation of art. And one of them is exactly the fact that the artist is intending um, to communicate something to the viewer. And that intention is actually really important, uh, which is largely missing from all of these. And another litmus test that he proposes is whether any of us would be comfortable with assigning authorship of the artwork to the computer as opposed to the algorithm designer. So um, pretty much all computer art that we have today if you put it in a museum, uh, if there's a label next to it, the label has the programmer's name on it. And Aaron says that if we get to the point where we legitimately can't put the programmer's name there anymore, then we will have what he would consider to be creative art. And I don't think we're there yet either. So I think on those two fronts, we're definitely not there. But um, I do think that as humans, we often, um, get distracted by the superficial nature of what we think is art. So often we think that if you're using paint to put stuff on canvas, then it's art. Um, and increasingly, I think we'll see that non-social, non-emotive beings putting paint on canvas. And then we'll realize, we'll realize that that isn't what art was. Art was something else that was happening with paint and canvases, but it wasn't the paint and the canvas. No, it doesn't have to be just one medium. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of using paint as an example here. Um, but I think these technologies will uh, force us to, to think more carefully about what we're actually trying to do. Um, and also, there's always going to be um, new media that are, is created when these technologies come about. So in that same paper, Aaron says something, said something that blew my mind, which was that when photography was introduced, um, it, was a, it was a tool for scientific measurement. And it took about 80 years um, for um, the first um, uh, photographic exhibition, artistic ex exhibition, to take place. So it took people 80 years of experimenting with the medium before other artists were convinced that this is actually art. And 80 years is a long time. That's like more than a lifetime of experimenting with a new technology before people said, OK, 
OK, this is art as well. Um, and I think similar things will happen in this space as well. But you always see it as a combination. Oh, for sure, yeah. The human and the machine. Yeah. And um, more or less in balance. Yeah, absolutely. And if we get to the point where it's not a combination anymore, like if we have just the machine that's producing art that we enjoy to the same extent, then I think the, the computer in other ways will, it will also be indistinguishable from humans. You know, what is the difference at that point? Um, yeah. So any more questions? Yeah. So thank you for an excellent talk first. Um, <clears throat> for the uh, mimetic generation, for example, I think uh, you, you say, you know, our phone can make something look like Van Gogh. Our phone can make something look like Munch. But if you go one further, say, you know, like I think your next slide even, uh, you know, the, the hard part maybe here is not uh, how do we transfer the style onto this sort of tubing, but how do we even come up with the style. So in mm -hmm. some sense, you could argue maybe this is part of the creative aspect. So one thing I really liked about your later example is you showed um, you know, when you restrict the number of strokes, then you get a sort of spontaneous generation of new styles. But they're still all fundamentally, I guess, aiming to be representational. I don't know. Do you have thoughts mm -hmm. on this? Because I think it kind of fits in in some sense with where, where do these styles come from, or where does this sort of abstraction come from? Do you see? Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so a couple of things on that. So one is, um, I think a realization that I had from, um, from AlphaGo, for instance, is that um, prior to the existence of AlphaGo, if we had thought to um, create a Go agent, I think many of us would have thought that, OK, you need a module that knows what beauty looks like in this game. You need a module that knows what it looks like to be aggressive or defensive. Uh, you need a module that knows what a sneak attack is. Um, and all of those different concepts that we're taught uh, when we play Go. And it turns out that those concepts aren't actually causally important. They're labels that we assign to certain strategies. As humans, we assign them. And they're not actually part of the game. Um, and I think. With art, it can also be the same. So we, we like to kind of separate style from substance, right? Um, we like to separate, um, say, emotion from uh, subject matter. And I think some of those distinctions are actually potentially arbitrary. They're what we're projecting onto the, the, the image and not what's actually there. So that's one point. The other point is that. Um, uh, you reminded me of something that I wanted to say, which was that in AlphaGo, move 37, we can consider that to be a creative move because it's actually in a very quantitative environment. So the agent made that move, the game proceeded, the agent won, and therefore we can say, OK, that was arguably a good move. In the stuff that I showed later on with the portraits, it's not so quantitative. It's more qualitative and it's subjective. So the computer's drawn something that I look at and I say, yeah, that looks like a face. That looks interesting. I'd, I'd be happy to have it on the wall. But I can't actually like, quantify it. And I've tried. You know, I tried to write a paper. And you can't. Um, because at the end of the day, it's like, I like it. You might not like it. And it made me realize that certain domains are much more easier to, um, uh, to study creativity in. And certain domains are harder. And then that leads me to my final point, which is the boundary between um, randomness and creativity um, is actually, I think, quite thin. So if you think about a random agent playing AlphaGo, um, a random agent would have played that move, no, no problem. You just have to wait a long time, and it would have made that move. Um, but the reason why that move in uh, in that game was good because you know it's not a random agent. It's a very performant agent. And also, you can, you can attach a randomly moving robot arm to a brush and a canvas, and we will produce lots of things that are totally outside the realm of styles that we're familiar with. Um, 
But unless it's actually evoking an emotion or a concept in your head, it's not really worth it. You know? If it doesn't look like a face, why do I care? So it's interesting, this, this idea of where is the boundary between actual creative genius and just randomness. Um, and I think that boundary is not so clear. Hi. I, first of all, thanks for the talk. It's been it's been quite quite interesting. I haven't played Go uh, with the Little Stones, but I'd like in that move thirty seven. Did it? Did people learn something? Did people learn a style of playing Go they didn't know about? And did the computer say, "Hang on a minute, I got to something"? And did he? Was the computer somehow could or could you trace a recognizable style that came on the computer just because he got "Hang on a minute, just got this guy move thirty seven." Was there a moment that everybody learned something? Because that's part of what art is, right? Like picking up the style of somebody else is interesting. But those guys are famous because they developed a form of seeing the world nobody else did before. Yeah. So did the machine, well, first of all, did, it, did everybody else learn about it? And did the machine, they're like, hang on a minute. I got this on. Was that that or not really? Because the machine just went on and didn't really learn. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not a Go player myself, so I can't, I, I can't comment on the significance of the move myself, only through what I've heard. And what I've heard is that um, that move and those games have actually changed the way Go is played. Um, yeah, so th there's books written on the, the new kinds of strategies that have been developed, um, which I think goes to your point. Now, whether the computer realized that it was being creative, um, I don't think I don't think it would have known. Like to it, it's just playing the game in a proficient way, and um, there are I can imagine ways of uh, detecting those things. So you can compare with machine learning techniques. You can compare how the computer was playing with how humans normally play, and this would have stuck out as an outlier, like very easily. So you can detect them, but the computer itself. But w did that outlier attract more outliers? In future games, say, hang on, this guy is just doing the same trick every time. Um, I know I'm not a gold guy, but that would yeah. be the computer has figured out something nobody else had before. Yeah. And that's not trivial. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> no. it's interesting. That's, that's the same though, like Picasso understanding that he's Picasso. Yeah, he's Picasso, and then at some no, point. He never, because he never did that the well, first time. Because like Picasso. painting like Picasso is is quite easy. Like I've <laughs> no 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 no. I'm serious. I, I did true. study. Yeah. I did study with people that they say, "Hang on, I mean, this guy paints so well," and they could paint Picassos. Like they could just do it after two years of fine arts. They could, but it's just at the, the first time somebody did it with everybody else was just painting like whoever else. Was a minute where the guy became conscious of, okay, this is something new. Yeah. And there was a point of. So like with the first speaker said, you know, no, they broke the system somehow. But it's, the, the, I'm just, yes. <laughs> now, now we're going into a philosophical debate, though. More Which than, is the best bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly, because I think humans, are, in the last, I don't know how many, 10,000 years or something, they were afraid of thunder. Anything that they can understand or they fear its, uh, its supremacy, let's say. <laughs> they fear, okay, and they can, might create a god for it or something like this, so give it another 100 years maybe and then it'll be so trivial that, okay, the, the, the computer can create things and I can have, I, I agree with, <clears throat> with you about the aha moment, but I don't think that even Picasso, when, did, when he did the first Picasso, had an aha moment probably. Probably he had it when he sold it for, I don't exactly. know, 10,000, whatever, you know, the currency at the time. So I think that was the aha moment. Because when you have the inspiration, you know, I know you're an architect and I'm an architect. So when you have the inspiration, I not, it's not always profound that you also have like a, a reconfiguration of your knowledge of whatever. Yeah. Wow. So, yeah. I, yeah, so one thing that... I'm with the, I'm with the AlphaGo. <laughs> Um, thank you for the talk. It's really interesting, especially the last part, um, especially when you limit the number of steps um, to get like a face or something. Have you tried to get any sort of label out of it? Because it could be really interesting to help us understand like, you know, visual representation as a representation of knowledge or something. What do you mean by a kind of label? Like, would, the, would your algorithm also recognize that 
like you know the minimum or like a small number of features that you can represent a face or like you know something. Right. Okay. So this is getting to an interesting point, which is what does it mean to understand something? I think. Um, so clearly, the computer is producing these images, and you can. It's it's trivial to um, to retrace those steps. So you you can you know exactly which points the computer thinks are necessary to create an image of a face. Um, but for instance, this agent has never seen a face actually rotating. It's never touched the face. Um, it, it doesn't know what the eyes are for, what the nose is for, and so on. So it's a, a visual abstraction, perhaps, but it's a very impoverished abstraction. I don't think it resembles the kinds of abstractions that we actually have. Like when I look at someone else's face, I, I relate it to my own eyes, and I know what it feels like to kind of press on my eye or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers and, your question. And how, if you, you know, um, start again and give the same constraint, how consistent are the results? Right. You get? So these are, um, so the, it, it isn't very consistent, basically. The different images you're seeing here are from different agents. So they've started from scratch and trained and reached this result. And if you try and if you were to train the same thing from scratch, you it's likely that you would find a different result. But having said that, um, the images that I'm showing here, I've selected to be the interesting ones. There's a lot of repetition. There's a lot of um, boring faces. And I don't think if you were to take the same algorithm and run it another million times, you would suddenly end up with a new art style that we haven't discovered yet. I think this is largely what it's going to do. In that simulation environment, with this amount of time, with that algorithm, you're going to get images that kind of look like this. Have you tried anything? Sorry, last question. Have you tried anything very like restrictive? You know, like just straight line and very limited like mm. color. You know, you could get like a Mandre or any of the color yeah. field school. Yeah, we we haven't tried. I really wanted to do that experiment. Like I wanted to only give it circles, for instance. Like you've got three circles, put them on the page, and create a face. And um, we haven't done that, but I think it would work um, without any problem. If you look at this agent. Um, look at how it's getting the face across. I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. So it's like one gray stroke and two colors, and with that, it's getting the eyes and the lips, and um, and then this one is also quite an interesting one. So I, I don't. I think it would certainly work, um, but we just didn't have time to do that. Thank you. Um, thank you again. Um, I, I just have a small concern, and which is most probably a much bigger concern for society. But you know, obviously. GANs. GANs have been infamous for facilitating the creation of deep fakes, obviously. So how is DeepMind specifically working on being able to a safeguard against that or mm. create technology that ultimately would help us understand which are the real images and which are the ones created by an algorithm? And then to the gentleman's point, I'm usually the person arguing his side of the story, and I feel so great, so I can argue the opposite side now. <laughs> so I, I feel like humans are entering, or facilitated by technology as well, and the merge of infotech and biotech. I mean, humans could be hacked, and are hackable potentially within 10 years, or maybe more, but you know. Uh, being depressed or being happy would, is a biochemical process that could be encoded into a computer. So if that's really our sort of way of evaluating, well, is this good art or not, that potentially could be encoded. Still, humans can value human art much, much more and would be willing to pay more for it than art created by machines just because they'll be looking for connection, for something spiritual, for something that you know originated in a different geography or different sort of culture. So. <laughs> I just have to respond to that. <laughs> I can't help myself. But that is exactly my problem that I have, because um, what we're now talking about is, yes, I can encode the depression. What I can't encode is the emotion that comes with the um, um, depression and how the um, um, emotion leads um, to the character um, or the building of the character. So um, the thing is, and that is exactly what uh, my issue was with AlphaGo. For me, it is not an artistic um, expression. It is a, a technical expression. It's a mathematical calculation behind it. 
it calculates um, all mathematical possibilities and then more or less comes up with a new um, um, approach to play the game. And we say that's creativity. No, it's not creativity. <laughs> no, that's, that's not exactly what. But see, that's what it is. It's and I think an that's because it's so constrained, yeah. while this isn't constrained, it got us somewhere we never were. Okay, guys, I think this discussion is probably moving into the, the drink, drink session rather than the... Uh... Yeah. Right, we're not going to take any more questions, but there will be drinks. Would you like to respond to that collection of uh, sure, questions? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, on, on the point of um, kind of deep fakes, I think it's a really important point, and um, it's uh, a seriously concerning use of this, t this kind of technology. Um, and I know that there's people who, whose research topic is um, preventing those kinds of applications. So there's a lot of research being done in detecting fakes um, and also um, kind of making these systems robust to adversarial attacks and um, and things of that like. And it's not something that I have particular expertise in myself. Um, the one good thing about these paintbrush agents is that you know, it's far from looking super realistic. So I think we're safe on that front. Um, yeah, and with regards to creativity, I think, yeah, that's the drinks um, <laughs> level topic. <laughs> cool.